glad we're all here this week, uh, which is a somewhat eventful week. Jeff is going to ask me a few questions. I, I just can't believe it's 40 years, just to, by way of introduction, can't believe it's 40 years since that MMWR report to uh, CDC, which uh, was June 5th, 1981. And uh, wow, how those 40 years have, have kind of blown by. But I was uh, 33 at the time. And uh, if you add 40 to that, uh, the, the numbers work, it all adds up. So uh, at the time I was an assistant professor at, uh, oh, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> So that's actually 1984, three years later, and I've already aged quite a bit. I've lost a bit of hair that I previously had uh, in the front there. Uh, this is 1984, which was a very eventful year, but uh, I look somewhat like that uh, with uh, very large glasses. And uh, I still wear blue shirts, uh, no longer buttoned down. So Jeff, do you wanna go ahead and uh, prompt me a little bit? Sure. So um, I guess when we kind of start at the beginning, since this, this is the 40th anniversary on um, Saturday, the 5th, um, of when you first made those case reports. So when did you first encounter um, cases of what later became known as HIV AIDS and what was that like? And So sure enough, I, it, was, it was January 1981 and Reagan had just been inaugurated. Uh, so I know it's a name that that probably shouldn't be mentioned in these circles. He had just been inaugurated and uh, I was uh, a junior professor at UCLA at the Medical Center in Westwood. And uh, I had come there in uh, June of 1980 to do research on uh, tissue and organ transplantation. And that research wasn't going very well because it depended on mice. And I was always much better as a people doctor than a mouse doctor. So the mice were not doing very well. But I took my job, took my job seriously. Uh, Tracy's laughing. I, I, I took my job seriously and I, I said, well, I'll teach some immunology to the residents and uh, the postdoctoral fellow uh, who is you know, aspiring to be a clinical immunologist. And so I asked him to go off to the wards and talk to the interns and residents and find out if there were any patients who had interesting immunologic features to their illnesses. And so he went off to the wards and he encountered a young intern named Robert Wolf, who had gone to Harvard Medical School. And uh, Robert was uh, taking care of a 31 year old man, very thin with uh, bleach blonde hair, kind of looked a bit like a rock star. And uh, this man uh, had lost a lot of weight, uh, had unexplained fevers, and had thrush. And so this looked like somebody with a cellular immune problem. And uh, it was very puzzling because it just didn't happen that adults, you know, in midlife develop problems such that they would get thrush. So he had no prior chemotherapy. He wasn't an organ transplant patient. Uh, he was clearly immune deficient. And so uh, we took his cell, we took a blood sample, we took it to the lab and T cell technology, you know, the ability to detect uh, CD4 versus CD8 versus other cells was very new. And so uh, we were able to do this on a research basis in one of the laboratories and found that his CD4 cells were very, very low. And Jeff, do you have a slide of that somewhere or no? Ah, uh, let me see what you sent me. Yeah, like a histogram slide, if there is one. I'm not seeing one of those. Okay. So his T cells were very low and we sort of scratched our heads oh. to what he, might, what he might have. And so uh, he clearly was very openly gay. And uh, Randy Schultz in his book and the band played on says something to the effect of Gottlieb, but uh, took no more note of that than if the man had told him he drove a Ford. <laughs> 
because it was really, uh, it was really, uh, you know, nothing. I mean, it was important demographic, of course. Oh, that's a lovely one. Let's look at that first slide. Yeah, that's it, Jeff. Can we blow that up? Oh, there we go. Yeah, let me see if I can get a presentation. Yeah. Okay. So uh, very clearly, he, uh, uh, yeah, he very clearly told us he was a gay man. Okay, cool. You know, I'd known gay men in, in previous lives in other, uh, other cities. So, but we didn't take a particular interest in that point. And so we took his T cells to the lab. And if you can see on the very, what you see in that purple thing is uh, at the very bottom left of the purple uh, uh, slide, you see MP and that's patient number one. And only 10% of his T cells were CD4. So that was pretty interesting. Like, why did someone in previously good health now have virtually absent CD4 cells? They'd gone missing. And uh, so this patient was discharged from the hospital. And then within a week, he came back short of breath. And you can see on the upper left of that slide, you can see his x-ray, which uh, if you really were to look at it very carefully, uh, shows uh, some kind of pneumonia. And uh, so the intern, Robert Wolf, uh, said, well, you guys are telling us that this patient is immune deficient. Uh, we have to be very aggressive and find out uh, what kind of pneumonia this is. And so uh, he said, we need to do a bronchoscopy. And he pushed the pulmonary doctors who didn't want to, to do a bronchoscopy. And lo and behold, you'll see what they found on the upper right, those, uh, uh, those clear little objects called pneumocystis, which was called pneumocystis carini back in the day on uh, what's called a silver stain. So that was found in the bronchial secretions. And so here, we had this man who had lost all his weight, who had unexplained fevers, which were surely due to the pneumocystis that was brewing. And uh, I said, oh, very interesting. Uh, what's going on here? Uh, pneumocystis, I had never seen a case ever in the whole course of my training. So what's going on? And then I was patched together with Dr. Joel Wiseman, uh, a doctor in Sherman Oaks, which is in the San Fernando Valley. And Joel and Jean uh, Rogalski had a practice together where it catered to the gay community. And I was patched together with Joel, who told me that uh, he had a number of other patients who uh, were similarly ill. He didn't know that they had pneumocystis, but they had unexplained, unexplained fevers. And he agreed to transfer two of those patients to the UCLA Medical Center, where they came under my care. And the first thing we did was to check their T cells. And uh, the next two, as you can see on the bottom of that slide, zero and zero, they had zero CD4 cells. The normal CD4 cell, you can see on that histogram on the right. So the first thing we did when we had these patients admitted, and this probably, you're talking maybe March or April of 1981. Uh, the first thing we did was to, uh, uh, check their CD4 cells, and then we moved on and did bronchoscopies because they also had pulmonary uh, abnormalities and they had pneumocystis as well. And they were gay men. And so suddenly we had three patients with absent T cells and pneumocystis pneumonia. And then in the next uh, few uh, weeks, we acquired a couple of more patients, similar. And we decided to make a report to the CDC, which is what we're talking about today, 40 years later. And so you might ask the logical question is, how did these men get so sick so quickly? When did they get infected with HIV? Which of course we didn't know about at the time. And my theory is that uh, these patients were infected in the late 70s and they uh, had a very rapid course with their HIV. They progressed from just being HIV positive to having zero CD4 cells in a very short period of time. And they must have been very susceptible to the virus. It wasn't a different virus. It wasn't more aggressive. Uh, they probably hadn't had it longer because when you look back at 
when HIV probably entered the US, or at least entered the gay male population, it probably wasn't before 1977. It might have been in the US as early as the early 60s, very sporadically. But uh, what we're now calling uh, uh, the HIV AIDS epidemic probably was brewing in the late 70s. Randy Schultz uh, takes some poetic license and says that it had to do with the 1776 uh, uh, celebration, uh, 200 years of uh, uh, the US. Uh, but that's somewhat that, that it came in to New York City through people coming in from all over the world. That's speculative, but uh, that certainly makes good reading. And so uh, I remember these first patients extremely well. Uh, the, the memory of these, these young men was really indelible uh, for me. Uh, I remember uh, what they looked like. I remember their stories. I remember their lovers. And I remember some of their parents. I remember what these guys looked like, what their hobbies were, because we were so interested in uh, understanding what was wrong with them. And we felt very badly for them uh, in that we, we had so little to offer them other than uh, the ICU care and uh, antibiotics. And I'll toss it back to you, Jeff. Great, thank you. Let me uh, stop the screen share and go to my next question here. Oh, let me tell you how we wrote it up. So, so we, <laughs> so at that point in time, I, I thought this was something worthy of publication. So I called the editor of the New England Journal of Medicine, which is of course a very prestigious medical journal, and told him that I thought we had something uh, bigger than Legionnaires' disease. And he said, "Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah." Uh, no, he didn't say that. He he actually was quite sympathetic, and he said, "Well, have you called CDC? If you think you have something of public health." import, uh, would you, uh, you really ought to call CDC. And of course, uh, I was not particularly oriented towards CDC not being an infectious disease doctor uh, or a public health person. Uh, and so I called uh, the CDC's man in Los Angeles, who was a, a young doctor uh, named Wayne Shandera, who worked at the health department for a couple of years and assigned by CDC. And I knew Wayne from uh, his residency at Stanford. And I asked him if he had seen or heard of anything unusual going on among gay men here in Los Angeles. And there was an eerie silence on the other end of the phone when he said no. So CDC was unaware of what was going on at this time, although in truth, CDC was aware retro retrospectively. <laughs> Uh, and I'll tell you why. Uh, so uh, he called CDC. CDC said, well, we don't know anything about it. And uh, uh, we sat down and wrote up these cases on his dining room table in the Fairfax district of Los Angeles. We wrote these cases out longhand. And then we had them, we typed them on an IBM Selectric typewriter, which any of the younger people on this phone call uh, don't remember or have never heard of. You all remember the, the spinning ball, right? <laughs> Tracy, I see you. Okay, so, <laughs> so uh, we, we just typed this thing up and we sent it off to Atlanta with an editorial that we wrote, uh, speculating as to the cause of this, which we were totally wrong about. Although it was a virus that we just hadn't identified. We thought it was viral, but we uh, hadn't identified the virus. And so CDC published it on June 5th, 1981 in MMWR. And uh, uh, immediately uh, they published it uh, as the second article. They didn't think it was such a big story. They published it as the second article in the little MMWR it comes out and has you know, four or five little infectious disease blurbs in it. And uh, it was called, we had titled it Pneumocystis Pneumonia Among Homosexual Men in Los Angeles. And they changed the title. Yeah, that's a nice one. They changed the title to uh, Pneumocystis Pneumonia Los Angeles. 
and they deleted the homosexual men. Which in retrospect, I, I don't think it reflected any kind of bias, although it may have reflected un discomfort with uh, characterizing people as homosexual in 1981. Uh, but in retrospect, uh, perhaps they did us all service, although ultimately, as you know, a, uh, AIDS got characterized as a gay disease uh, you know, for other reasons. So um, uh, once that thing was published, you know, the phone started ringing off the book with people asking about how do you manage pneumocystis pneumonia, which of course I knew very little about. And uh, so in retrospect though, CDC had been getting lots of requests for the drug pentamidine uh, all throughout uh, the latter half of 1980. And pentamidine was used for the treatment of pneumocystis pneumonia. That's the only reason pentamidine was ever prescribed. And CDC was the sole dispenser of pentamidine. And so there had been a run on pentamidine in 1980 that CDC didn't notice. Or the person who was dispensing the drug somehow didn't bring to the attention of somebody else. Um, so there was something clearly going on in the latter part of 1980. Uh, Jeff has put up this slide. I'll identify some of the personalities here. Can we, uh, do, you, do you all see that slide on the screen? Yeah. So can you, uh, I'll tell you who they are. So the first person on the left there is Gaetano Giraldo. The next person is uh, Elke Beth, his wife, a scientist also. Giraldo's from Naples, Italy. The next person is the young woman I was married to at the time, uh, Cindy, uh, Cindy Gottlieb. And then the person on the right is Jean-Claude Sherman, who is part of the team of doctors who identified uh, LAV, which became HIV. Jean-Claude was the doctor who should have shared in the Nobel Prize, uh, but somehow was not uh, included. And then can we look at the bottom half of the screen? This is at a meeting in Washington, DC, probably 1984. So on, in this photo here, you see Jean-Claude on the left, you see yours truly on the right, and then you see uh, Francoise barré Sanusi, who did win the Nobel Prize for the discovery of HIV. But Jean-Claude and uh, Francoise had equal contributions. And for some reason, uh, Jean-Claude didn't make the cut. And then on the right, you see Nathan Klumek, who from Belgium, who is the first person to describe AIDS in Africa. And we're all partying there somewhat. You see a bottle of wine on the table. There's Francoise in a good mood. She was usually in a good mood, but she's usually smoking a cigarette, which she has in her right hand. If you can see it, I believe there is a cigarette there, or at least the, the end of one. <laughs> Okay, and uh, she's a great person. She was totally deserving of the Nobel Prize. Uh, her, uh, her boss was Luc Montagnier. As her boss, he got to share in it as well. And so the thing they did was uh, take a lymph gland from a gay man in Paris who had what we used to call the lymphadenopathy syndrome. Uh, he was clearly HIV positive and they cultivated it in the test tube and uh, uh, clearly showed, do we have anything else on that slide there? I don't think so. No, that's it. They clearly showed the uh, rise of this enzyme called reverse transcriptase in the culture medium. And that identified what they were looking at as a retrovirus, a virus that uh, has an RNA genetic material and makes a DNA copy of its own genetic material using this enzyme reverse transcriptase. And then they took electron micrographs of this thing and they saw viral particles in the culture medium. So this is something that I heard about for the first time in Naples, Italy at a meeting that was chaired by Dr. Giraldo, who you saw in one of those previous slides. He had been a doctor uh, working at Sloan Kettering in New York City, a cancer center. He had been working on Kaposi's sarcoma for many years. 
and he was sure that Kappa C sarcoma had a viral cause because there's a belt in Africa, across Africa, called the uh, Kappa C, the lymphoma belt. It's a belt across Africa. There were uh, too many people had Kappa C sarcoma and lymphomas. So he was sure that uh, based on the geography, it was a virus. So he had worked on that for many years at Sloan Kettering. And so he had jumped into the uh, research field uh, after AIDS was described because we were seeing lots of cases of Kappa C sarcoma. And of course, in retrospect, Kappa C sarcoma is caused by a virus. It's caused by HHV8, which was discovered probably 25 years ago and now, or maybe 15 years ago, 20 years ago, uh, by some researchers in New York. And so, what happens with HIV is that in the setting of HIV infection of immune deficiency, people can also acquire HHV8. And they, those are the people who had Kappa C sarcoma back in the day. And so, you know, uh, Francoise Barre and Montagnier got the Nobel Prize for discovering HIV. And we were often running with regard to trying to find therapy. Thank you for this. This is fascinating to hear some of the, the details of what was going on back then. Sure. It wasn't being reported in the media. So unless you, you know, read something and, and the band plays on or, you know, really a lot of the documentaries, people don't know what it was like back then. So for you as a young clinician who was ended up caring for AIDS patients uh, for whom you really couldn't do very much at the time, what was that like? And what was the, the political climate that you were operating in at the time? Well, it's pretty awful, of course. Uh, you were taking care of people who are desperately ill and getting one infection after another. And uh, you really had, and certainly before the discovery of the virus, you didn't have any ideas to how to treat them. You know, you did some, some silly things with uh, immune modulators uh, that had been little drugs looking for a disease to treat. And you'd never, they never found, in retrospect, they, they never never identified anything that they worked for. I bet you played around with those, uh, but it was very, very frustrating. And politically, um, there was a lot of, what, is, what should I say, inertia. Uh, we weren't going anywhere. Uh, yes, thanks. Uh, Reagan was surrounded by uh, uh, some evangelicals who uh, did not, believe that anything constructive ought to be done for people uh, with AIDS, which hadn't been named yet. It was named in, in, in November of 1982, CDC named it AIDS. Um, my guess is Reagan, uh, although ultimately somewhat sympathetic at least to Rock Hudson, it just wasn't on his radar as something his constituency was going to approve of to do something affirmative like, uh, like a Manhattan Project to find treatment for, uh, for HIV. Uh, someone told me, I believe quoting Don Francis, uh, one of the early uh, researchers at CDC, was that CDC was told by HHS to look pretty and do nothing. So. Uh, but in fact, CDC did quite a bit. CDC sent teams out to major cities, did a lot of the epidemiology, uh, described a cluster of, uh, of HIV cases surrounding uh, 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 so-called patient zero, uh, Gaetan Dugas, uh, the flight attendant, uh, cases in LA and Orange County who were linked through sexual contact. And that was even before the discovery of HIV. The CDC did quite a lot, but they didn't do anything in terms of patient and public education, as best I can tell. They educated uh, physicians through the MMWR. They issued many, many MMWRs, but there was no one uh, uh, who, like Surgeon General Coop, who uh, took on the job of educating the public. No one at CDC became uh, a spokesperson. The Jim Curran at CDC was very effective at doing the basic epidemiology and, and running the show there, but he never became a household word. 
as did uh, Surgeon General Coop, and now Tony Fauci. Uh, so eventually Coop, I think probably around 1984 or so, and what you see there, by the way, is Los Angeles back in the day on the slide, and then you see the UCLA Medical Center as it looked back then, prior to becoming the Ronald Reagan Hospital <laughs> at the David Geffen School of Medicine. Go figure that out. Okay, so uh, Coop eventually uh, took a leadership role and against the against the orders of President Reagan, uh, you know, sent a mailing to every household in the United States in both English and Spanish on a one-time only basis. And that described the basics of what we knew about uh, the disease AIDS at the time and cautioning people. Uh, I can't remember the specific cautions that were included, but cautioning people that this was something that could be spread sexually. But it didn't go sp to specific populations. It didn't go to gay men. It went to everybody in America, which one could say, and hey, that's a good thing. And ultimately, Surgeon General Coop, when, when critiqued for this, said uh, you know, he was not in a position to judge any of uh, people who were in his flock, so to speak, you know, the American public. He said, I'm, I'm, I agreed to be the Surgeon General of all the people. And he was a cool guy who I actually got to meet and, and, and spend some time with. And I have a photo somewhere. <laughs> I can't find it of the two of us together. So what happened next? Uh, as a clinician, this was very uh, troubling, not having anything uh, to use to treat patients. And patients were dying. And we were opening up AIDS units at Sherman Oaks Hospital here in the city in a Midway hospital. And uh, it was very frustrating. You know, lots of uh, LGBTQ people came to work on those units as, as nurses and nursing assistants. And uh, it was a real community effort. And then organizations uh, were, were founded uh, you know, here in Los Angeles, APLA and Desert Age Project and, and San Francisco AIDS Foundation because Communities had to respond to this. I'm going to move a little closer. <laughs> Communities had to respond to this because uh, Jeff's looking too big there. I got to look. I got to look bigger. <laughs> <laughs> so communities are responding to this, uh, but the government wasn't. So the political climate was really bad, and it it wasn't what it is today. You know it, what it is today is as a result of lots of hard work and effort on the part of your community. Uh, to uh, gain acceptance, but back then it was uh, it was it was people were very marginalized. And the gay community was very marginalized and uh, not not uh, the mainstream population didn't see uh, this as something that was a priority. Plus, they were fearful of it. They were fearful uh, of gay men. They were fearful of, of something contagious. And they uh, were not, uh, there I am. I did shake his hand, yeah, yeah sorry. <laughs> this is 1987 when he finally said the word AIDS. And so there you see Ronnie, Nancy, and Merv Silverman. Merv, who was the health department director in uh, San Francisco who closed the bathhouses and uh, became the first uh, something at AMFAR once we founded that. Okay, you can take that off now, Jeff. <laughs> I can hear the collective, the collective boos out there in, <laughs> in the audience. So my, I, didn't, I never liked that photo, but my mother did. <laughs> and so it spent most of its life on her, her dresser somewhere. <clears throat> and I inherited it. So uh, moving forward a bit, uh, the political climate was not good and the funding climate was not good. We didn't have any money to do any work with. So Willie Brown, who was speaker of the California Assembly and prior and subsequently became mayor of San Francisco, Willie put through a line item in the state of California budget for AIDS research centers to be done 
at UCLA and UC San Francisco. And Marcus Conant in San Francisco headed up the San Francisco branch and I headed up the UCLA branch. And so we got a few hundred thousand dollars each to start doing some research and it was helpful. But the real uh, increase in research funding didn't come about until Rock Hudson, which was 1985. And so we spent four years sort of scratching for research funds and piggybacking our, our AIDS work on funding that had been awarded for other reasons. But then Rock Hudson came along. Are you ready for that, Jeff? I don't have any Rock Hudson photos, but I do have um, Matilda Krim and Elizabeth Taylor. But you have uh, any questions before that? Oh, um, no. I mean, yeah, just kind of going through the chronology and telling us what it was like for you getting, uh, that was the next question actually, you know, how did people respond and what did you do, so. Yeah, people were, uh, it really didn't get on most people's radar until Rock Hudson. So Rock Hudson uh, is somebody who I first saw in the mid, probably June of 1984. And uh, I'm sitting at my desk at the UCLA Medical Center and I get a phone call, cold call from his dermatologist in Beverly Hills who asks me to come out to uh, her office to, to see Rock. Because uh, if he were to come to the UCLA Medical Center, it would create a, a stir and there'd be you know, paparazzi and. Uh, all that. So I went out to her office and I met Rock, uh, who uh, was very cordial and had a little Kaposi sarcoma on his forearm. That's why he was at the dermatologist. And I took his blood and took it back to the medical center to check his T cells. And um, sure enough, his T cells were, were off. But in, in, in talking with him, uh, uh, I examined him and I asked him to hop up on an exam table. And then I, I looked up and I said, you're very tall. And uh, he kind of chuckled boyishly and he said, oh, yeah, 6'4". <laughs> uh, and I didn't appreciate that, but I hadn't known about that. But, but anyway, he was a very nice person and uh, very good looking. Uh, he wasn't quite as emaciated as you might have remembered him from some of the magazine covers back in the day, you know, when he eventually wound up on the cover of People magazine with Doris Day, he was really quite emaciated and had progressed. But when I first saw him, he was actually pretty well looking, well enough to appear on Dynasty with uh, Linda Evans. Uh, so... Uh, you know, Rock asked, well, you think I have AIDS? Yeah, I think, I think, I think you do. And uh, he, uh, oh, they're there. So, yeah, so people were distressed when they saw this photograph. Uh, so, uh, um, Rock wanted to do something about having this. And, and Americans were flying to Paris. Uh, lots of men, young men, from, primarily from New York and San Francisco were going to Paris to get this medicine called HPA-23, which was infused intravenously and which had had some uh, benefit apparently in, in mouse uh, leukemia uh, virus uh, uh, situations. And so the French being, you know, the compassionate people compared to the Americans, the Americans were characterized as uncaring and the French were characterized as caring. And so the, uh, the French were giving HPA 23 off protocol, total compassionately to patients who were flying to Paris. And a lot of young men were going to Paris to do this. And so uh, said, Rock, if you wanna do something, you could go to Paris. Said, well, I'm going to Cannes to the film festival and uh, I can stop off in Paris. So we arranged for him to, to meet with uh, Dominique Dormont, who is a young Navy doctor who was overseeing the studies of this drug. And, and Dominique would go up to his hotel room, Rock's hotel room at the Ritz, 
and do these infusions of uh, HPA 23 sporadically. I think altogether he might have had three or four infusions on different trips to Paris. He didn't stay there. And then on one trip, uh, the last trip, he collapsed in the lobby of the Ritz Hotel, uh, probably looking a bit like he was very, very ill. He had been ill. And uh, he was taken to the American Hospital in Paris, where it was announced by a spokesperson that Rock had AIDS. And that's all she said. And he was flown back to Los Angeles uh, in the first class cabin of a 747 with the hospital bed bolted to the floor and no other passengers. This particular flight is something I arranged with uh, Pierre Salinger, who was uh, uh, JFK's press secretary and, and a confirmed Francophile. So, Pierre was living in Paris and, and made this arrangement to get Rock back at the cost of $250,000. And so he's flown back from Paris, arrives at the UCLA Medical Center, desperately ill. Uh, I figure that he's got pneumocystis because we didn't know back then about how to prevent it, how to prophylax it with something simple like Bactrim. And so uh, we treated him for pneumocystis and he survived. And uh, toward the end of his hospitalization, he was looking pretty good. Uh, during that hospitalization, Miss Taylor visited him a number of times and I uh, escorted her to visit her friend, uh, Rock. Uh, and uh, she'd spend time at the bedside with him. And then toward the end of his hospitalization, the press was all over us uh, asking about, uh, well, did he have AIDS? What's wrong with him, et cetera. And so I sat down with him and said, the press are clamoring for information. Uh, what do you think? He said, uh, look, if it'll do some good. Uh, go ahead and tell them. So it's his decision to allow me to announce uh, to the press that Rock indeed had AIDS, to confirm what the people in Paris had said uh, a couple of months earlier. And this is all happening in August, I think, of 84. And then he, he I'm sorry, this is happening in August of 85, and he died in October of 85. And people say that uh, Rock's disclosure you know, changed uh, the world, at least the AIDS world, that uh, suddenly people were interested. Uh, you know, Ronald Reagan knew about it, uh, somebody he knew from his acting career. And uh, around that time, uh, Paul Volberding and I and James Oleski from Newark testified before Henry Waxman's committee in Washington about the need for treatment research. And so the combination, I think, of that testimony of Henry Waxman and Rock Hudson, suddenly the NIH was offering a request for proposals for AIDS treatment evaluation units, which is the predecessor of the ACTG, or AIDS clinical trials groups. And so finally, some money was coming our way specifically for treatment. The only problem was there were no treatments that were promising other than AZT. And we began studies of AZT probably in 1984. Uh, I think Paul Volberding was the principal investigator in San Francisco. I was principal investigator in Los Angeles and there were like several other sites. And AZT was, let's just say as a single agent, marginally better than placebo. This was the very controversial placebo control trial. And AZT got approved. And some people say, well, that's, that was just terrible. But, but AZT was the proof of, proof of the principle that you could find a drug, you know, a failed cancer drug became a useful treatment for HIV. And it inhibited reverse transcriptase, the enzyme that the virus uses. And that was the beginning of HIV drug development. And industry took notice. 
that you could make money and maybe do a good thing by developing medicines for this pandemic. And look at where we are today, 40 years later, single pills, injectable therapies, uh, cure research going on. It's just a great story. I think it's speaking of stories, uh, you were one of the, uh, the people involved at the beginning of the AM, of AMFAR, which I know for many of us was a, a real lifeline. I know living in Chicago at the time, I waited you know, with great anticipation for that brown paper envelope that they sent it in, like it was pornography or something. But mm -hmm. the AMFAR um, you know, uh, quarterly report that talked all about the treatments and where the trials were and things like that. And for the internet, that, that was all we had. Yeah, well, on a national basis, uh, we had these. We had our local organizations, you know, Desert AIDS Project, uh, APLA, but Rock Hudson gave us an opportunity to establish a national foundation, and that was done with Mathilde Krem in New York, and Elizabeth Taylor became our national spokesperson. There we are announcing it. Okay, and Mathilde was looking away from me because Mathilde was not very fond of me. Let's just say that, <laughs> and so. Uh, she was, uh, Elizabeth was fond of me, Matilda wasn't very fond of me. I don't know who this other person is. So what, I, uh, probably Joyce Swerdlin, Matilda's lawyer. So uh, we founded AMFAR, it's a, quite a story as to how it came about. Matilda had established a little foundation in New York called the AIDS Medical Foundation. Well, her heart was in the right place. Uh, however, Rock Hudson's uh, estate gave us gave me two hundred and fifty thousand dollars to do whatever I wanted with. Truly, so this is your money. So what we did was form uh, something called the National AIDS Research Foundation here in Los Angeles. And after the first commitment to life event in Los Angeles, where Elizabeth was awarded the commitment to life award and the event raised a million dollars, Matilde and her people made a beeline for Hollywood. And they knew that Hollywood was gonna have deep pockets. And uh, she was quite right. And then we had a somewhat shotgun marriage uh, organized by David Geffen who was a friend of hers, because he had some film connections as well. And she was married to Arthur Krim, who was the owner of United Artists Pictures. So there's a Hollywood uh, uh, subplot here. <laughs> and uh, so uh, uh, despite my reluctance to, to give up uh, control of the National AIDS Research Foundation, we merged the two as MFAR, the American Foundation for AIDS Research. And uh, I think it was the right thing to do. What I can say is that Mathilde squeezed me out of that politically within a year. And she got to run MFAR uh, basically from 1990 to the present. <laughs> oh. She's unfortunately deceased, but uh, from 1990 till now, she was the prevailing uh, force behind AMFAR. And they raised, as you probably know, a 25 million or so dollars at an event in Cannes every year at the film festival. A cute picture though. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you. This is great and a real walk down memory lane for many of us who are uh, good to hear some of the backstory of what was going on back then. So fast forward to this past year and uh, <laughs> suddenly where we're faced with another pandemic. What has that been for like, because you're still a practicing uh, clinician. What has that been like for you? Well, you know, COVID, uh, just the similarities, if you look at it for a minute, I mean, viruses, you know, probably from other species cross over into humans. And they're always more aggressive in, in the human species than they were in their, their host species. And, uh, oh, look at that, lovely. Who's that? No idea. That's my dog, I'm not moving around, so I didn't want to. extremely good looking dog with a great, with an excellent long tongue. 
<laughs> so, uh, uh, yeah, how, what's it been like? Well, very reminiscent. Uh, the worst thing for me was was watching what, hap what happened in New York. When New York, those ICUs at the very beginning of it reminded me of our AIDS units back in the early 80s. You know, these people, you know, couldn't be helped in these ICUs. They, we had pneumonias and they were, they were, they were on oxygen and intubated. It, it, it looked like scenes from the early, uh, from the early eighties. And that, that was kind of a flashback for me. But what, what, you know, desperately ill with no treat and no treatments, no, no, uh, no treatments. So, uh, And then I saw the evolution of treatments and antiviral treatments. And I think, uh, as you know, there had been a lot of work on an HIV vaccine over the last uh, 40 years, and we still don't have one, but some of the technologies that were being looked at for, for COVID-19 were, uh, were, were, were developed in the search for, for an HIV vaccine. And it's been much more successful, obviously, for COVID-19 than it was for HIV. Uh, what we did as a clinician was we, we shut down, you know, for, for a couple of months. Uh, we handled things. We, and then we came back into the office. We, we did a little bit of, of video medicine, which I do not like. Uh, came back into the office. And... Uh, we, we were quite good at screening patients and doing a lot of advice over the telephone for patients who probably had COVID-19. And uh, we established, APLA established uh, testing sites where people would drive through and, and, and get tested. And the best thing that we've done, I think, was, was as we were able to offer the, the vaccine uh, to our patients. And uh, uh, all of our patients, but we have, we take care of both patients who are HIV positive and HIV negative and, and, and older patients as well. We're able to work down the hierarchy. And I think our patients were extremely grateful to be able to get, uh, get the vaccine right in our office rather than driving to Dodger Stadium or some other, other place. Uh, what about COVID and HIV? It, the, the, the studies are, uh, conflicting. Uh, some studies like South Africa and England suggest that the risk of, of serious illness may be two times greater for the person who's HIV positive, uh, but it's certainly not a huge, horrible risk. Uh, there's some study that suggested that low CP with low CD4 cells were more susceptible. In my own practice, you know, which is substantial in size, uh, uh, I've only had two deaths due to, to COVID-19 and both were quite regrettable, but what are you going to do? Mm. Yeah, thank you. I think it, there's PTSD for a lot of us and not just the disease itself, but then, you know, the, the political climate, which was even worse, which is hard to imagine. That's <laughs> right. Worse. Yeah, so you know what I said is that there, you know, two presidents dealt with two pandemics badly for different reasons. Each of them had their own own reasons, and they they blew it. So it's you know, with regard to public health, it's really important who's in charge and what they say. Yeah, complete and total lack of leadership, as you say in different ways. So. Yeah. Um, you know, fast forward to the present and we're, we're looking at the, there's some light at the end of the tunnel for COVID. And, you know, for this whole time, you've been treating many of the same patients for the duration of the epidemic. So what, it's, what is it like for you as somebody who's kind of grown up with the epidemic and caring for people as they get older, as you're getting older, right? So. Right. So, so, so back in the day, I said, well, what's your fond people would say, well, what's your fondest wish? You know, when, when things were very bad, I said, well, I to grow gray with my patients. And uh, remarkably, that seems to have happened. Although I, I lost more hair than, uh, than, than it turned color. 
So uh, it's been pretty amazing to see, you know, clinical trials and see uh, the improvement in prognosis, you know, gradual, gradual, gradual. You know, the, the big uh, development in 1995 with the cocktail figured out that three drugs, at least at that time, were the charm uh, that people can, and, and the development of the viral load assay, which didn't come about until 1995. So think of this, people, uh, for 14 years, 1981. Well, let's take, uh, let's take uh, 12 years. The discovery of the virus to the uh, ability to measure an undetectable viral load took 12 years to develop that technology. And so for 12 years, we're just flying blind. We're using CD4 counts, which was ridiculous. Uh, we didn't know what the real gold standard was of success until 1995. And now we know that U equals U. So tell me, you know, the viral load is, is, is critically important uh, for public health reasons and for the health of the individual person. So my waiting room, there's a lot of gray in my waiting room. <laughs> <laughs> and on the whole, I think that, uh, you know, people are looking at life as maybe the glass of water uh, uh, half uh, empty rather than half full. Or is it, did I get that right? Yeah. yeah. That, that uh, you know, I, many of my patients have lived with HIV longer than they lived without HIV. I mean, my patients were kids when they became HIV positive. And here they are today dealing with these comorbidities, uh, hypertension, diabetes, uh, some little bit of cognitive issues, some patients uh, dealing with the complications of earlier therapies like neuropathy and lipodystrophy and reasonably philosophical about it. You know, uh, many of my patients had to interrupt their lives. Uh, they had to stop their educations. They had to settle for jobs they didn't want to stay in because they had insurance through the job. Uh, some people thought they were going to die and went on disability and never got off. And uh, there was a lot of tragic uh, career changes that happened because of HIV. And on the whole today, I think therapy is simpler. People aren't taking 16, 20 pills a day. Uh, therapy is simpler. Uh, they're, uh, they've settled into surviving with HIV. So there's life after HIV. That's, that's true for long-term survivors and it's true for people newly diagnosed. Absolutely, thank you. So I'm inviting anyone who has questions, um, there's 40 some people on the call, to either put them in the chat box and I do see one hand raised. So I'm gonna unmute uh, Gary Hahn if you wanna go ahead. Yeah, thank you. First of all, for the story, doctor, very personal, really appreciate it. Uh, so a sort of a two-part question. Uh, was there one breakthrough therapy in those early days from 1983 to 1994 that helped a lot of patients? And second, why would some patients progress quickly in their symptoms and eventual death and others uh, proceed much more slowly. I happen to be one of the slow progressors from whatever I, I know now. Sure. So the first part of the question is there was, in terms of breakthrough therapy, uh, we were able to, uh, so DDI, that horrible uh, chalky uh, white tablet uh, that you had to mix with water or chew up, that came about in 1991. Uh, so we combined AZT and DDI in a two-drug cocktail, and it worked a little better than AZT alone, but there was no breakthrough therapy. 1994, I think uh, nevirapine, which is also called Viramune, uh, hit the market, and that, that was a very helpful medication, but it really breakthrough didn't take, take place until uh, 
95, 96. And then the second part of your question has to do, I think, more with genetics. In other words, I think some people are more susceptible, some people's T cells are more susceptible to, to damage. Uh, this could be speculation about the size of the inoculum with HIV. On average, it takes, based on the uh, Natural History of AIDS study, which is also called the MAX study, on average, it takes 11 years. Uh, I think the median time for progression was 11 years. In other words, 50% of people HIV infected progressed to AIDS with less than 200 CD4 cells by uh, 11 years. Oh. If you look at those very first patients, I mean, why did they get sick so quickly? And the only thing, and it's totally speculative, is, is uh, genetics and, and some unusual susceptibility. They didn't, weren't able to develop an effective immune response to the virus. So thanks. Thank you so much. Very riveting. Thank you. Thank you. And Andrew had a question. Go ahead, Andrew. Thank you. Yes, I, uh, your story, telling your story is absolutely fascinating because uh, I lived through that whole time and I'm aware of a lot of it, but getting your details is, is really intriguing and fascinating. Um, since you mentioned you think uh, HIV came into the being here sometime in the late 70s, I was, wanted to sort of extrapolate from my own case because I moved to New York from Los Angeles in 79 and I can remember very specifically when I had the so-called flu-like symptoms in early 82. Uh -huh. And so is there, is there an idea of when people, uh, when people get HIV, that then how long that space of time between getting HIV uh, develops into the flu-like symptoms? Oh, I think the flu-like symptoms are very early. Yeah. I think flu-like symptoms are, are acute HIV infection. Uh, although, you know, I think what you're referring to though is, is, is something that dragged on much longer. In other words, the, the flu-like symptoms can be part of acute HIV infection and that shouldn't last, I would say more than a month on the outside. Right. No, I, I for me, it was like about a week as I recall. Yeah. It's just, that, it's just that that's when I can date when I would have been HIV positive. Yeah, I think you're right. I think that was that was your first that was your HIV infection. Right. And 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 to tie into to what you just said about the time lapse, I I really I didn't get diagnosed with with an AIDS diagnosis until 95. So essentially about 13 years in terms of that interesting, you know, interesting. decline over time. And um, but also since you mentioned uh, CD4 counts, my awareness in my, you know, as a patient and, and learning this stuff at the time, I thought there wasn't knowledge about CD4s until sort of AIDS and HIV research was, but you talk about having uh, at least done lab tests on these early patients. So, yeah, so, so CD4. I'm curious to know a little bit more about that. Yeah, CD4, there wasn't, CD4s weren't, uh, weren't known about until, until these first cases. You saw that histogram that we showed earlier of the normal range versus the, our first patients. And uh, it was a research test. And so uh, CD4s were known about and, and, and uh, lab and met doctors were looking at CD4 counts in all sorts of disease states. Mm -hmm. It's actually ironic and fortunate, I suppose, that, uh, that at UCLA, I had access to this technology through Professor John Fahey, who was one of the senior immunologists there. And so I was able to get these samples run in his laboratory where he was looking at other disease states. And, and remarkably, you know, in this particular situation, the CD4s were more dramatically altered than in anything else they'd ever looked at. And the reason, of course, is that CD4 is the target cell for HIV. So there were some circumstances, some things fell into place that allowed me and my colleagues to put it together. Say, oh, here's this new disease. Here's the central immunologic abnormality, which is the decimation of CD4 cells. 
And uh, you're right, the technology was not widely available elsewhere. And that's why it happened at UCLA and not somewhere else. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Great, thank you. So there's a question in the chat, thanking you for your amazing talk and asking if you could comment on how you think the stigma of HIV has changed in the last 40 years. So how's the stigma changed? Uh, you maybe can answer that better than I. <laughs> uh, but here's my view from the outside. Uh, you remember what it was like then. It was just horrible. It was horrible. It was, you couldn't, you worried about drinking water from the same, not me, but you, they, they worried about drinking water, or doing laundry in the same load of laundry with the person with HIV, you know, total, total uh, fear. I think today people are maybe slightly less afraid of HIV than they were. Uh, although I know, um, I know that uh, it is still difficult. I am sure there are some families that will not have the person with HIV in the home. Uh, that's, that's, that's stigma. That's, I don't think that's truly, I mean, in some cases it may be fear of infection, but in other cases it's just prejudice. And uh, I do not advise my patients with HIV to come out to their employer uh, with regard to their HIV diagnosis, because at some point in time, it could very well be used against them. So I, I think things have gotten marginally better. The public is more aware. Young people, I think, are hipper in general and cooler about HIV than older people. Yeah, and it's interesting you talk to people, especially in the rural South and communities of color, where the the fear and the stigma are just as bad now as they were 40 years ago. It's, it's kind of shocking. But you're right, overall it has improved. And you mentioned U equals U, which I think has made a huge difference, especially I think among um, you know, the MSM community. Oh yeah, so the the MSM. Because you know, there was all that zero sorting in the MSM community and people hanging out with just HIV negatives and other people you know, hanging out with people who are HIV positive. And HIV negative is prejudiced against people who are HIV positive. And uh, I think U equals U has done something to, uh, to uh, mitigate that. We have another question asking um, if you think we have become complacent in our efforts to end HIV infection rather than treating it. So have we become complacent? Yeah, I don't think so. I don't think so. I know that uh, in, in, in uh, um, you know, there's still major vaccine initiatives uh, underway, uh, studies that are underway. There's a mosaic vaccine uh, that's in studies that we're hoping for some results in, by 2024. I think people are still working on, on HIV vaccines. Uh, you know, U equals U is an important uh, uh, intervention. Uh, I think that's going on in, in Sub-Saharan Africa where, where we're doing much more treatment and, and, and continuing uh, you know, the major uh, things that PEPFAR initiated in, in W's uh, uh, administration. Uh, so uh, no, I don't think we got complacent. In fact, I'm surprised at the amount of innovation, frankly, that is going on today. Uh, people looking at uh, treatment with injectables, people looking at the potential for a subdermal implant with one of the medications uh, in the future, uh, uh, something that goes under the skin and, and uh, eludes drugs slowly, uh, and, and cure strategies. Uh, those are afoot also. They're active studies of, of trying people trying to eradicate HIV from an individual, you know, based on the courageous example of Tim Brown, who so-called Berlin patient who uh, uh, took all sorts of risks and, and indeed is a proof of the principle that, that HIV can be eradicated from an individual's body. So I don't think we become complacent. It's really still... We're very 
very active and, and, and a lot of creativity and innovation happening. You mentioned Timothy, and of course he was lived in Palm Springs for the last few years of his life with his partner Tim, who I think is on. So yeah, we're very familiar with with Timothy's you know experience, and it was amazing. Even at local events, there were people who didn't realize who he was. Um, you know, you think the Berlin patient was all over the media, but uh, you know, mm -hmm. yeah, he he's a very very uh, very neat person. And uh, if I had my photo of myself with him, I would, I would splash it up there. <laughs> it's there. It's somewhere in my uh, in my uh, Instagram, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> You know, lots of pictures of Timothy. Yeah. Really missed. And actually, just a few weeks ago, uh, they dedicated a park bench in the park by the hospital here uh, with his name on it. And they're putting a boulder in the National AIDS Memorial Grove in Golden Gate Park. Uh, That's wonderful. As well. That's wonderful. When I met Timothy, the one time I met him, uh, I said to him, You're a celebrity. <laughs> and he laughs and he says, oh, you're, you're a celebrity. It's so okay. <laughs> yeah, we had a photo together, which was really sweet for me. Yeah. And he, you know, he loved meeting everybody like that. It, uh, it really brightened up his life and gave him a real sense of purpose. And he really took on the mantle of, uh, you know, being the poster child for cure. Yeah, we're sorry to lose him. Yeah, great loss. So, um, any other questions? Go ahead and raise your hand. I think we're all on one page. Bob Holtz writes, he doesn't have a microphone, but wanted to thank you deeply for your life of service and for your extraordinary presentation today. And uh, Jeff, could I say one more thing when the yeah, doctor please. is ahead, off Gary. the phone? I was just really touched by his personal stories with Rock Hudson and the story of how AMFAR developed, evolved from a bequest by Hudson for Dr. Gottlieb to use as he wished. Uh, and that he thought revelation of his uh, disease by his physician might help some other people. Yeah, it's truly amazing. So many incredible things happened. We kind of forgot. It's great to have this opportunity to re reflect and remember Jonathan, you have a question. Yes, <clears throat> doctor, do you have an opinion about the um, hospital in Houston that is requiring mandatory vaccination of staff and the staff are suing the hospital because they don't want to? Oh, well, it's sort of an unrelated question, but yeah, I do have an opinion. Uh, <laughs> uh, I do have an opinion and that is that uh, employers do have uh, a right to require a vaccination, particularly in a healthcare setting. Uh, you wouldn't want someone, I mean, vaccination reduces the risk of, of contracting COVID-19 dramatically. It's very effective and uh, you wouldn't want people with COVID-19 or unvaccinated coming into your hospital and uh, exposing particularly as healthcare workers and exposing patients to COVID-19. So I would, I would go, I would weigh in on the side of the hospital. Yeah, that's truly amazing. I mean, no other vaccine, you know, people have to get hepatitis vaccines. It's, it's just a matter of course. So it's really interesting that, that this one is being singled out. And again, it speaks to the politicization, politicization of the, the pandemic, which is really unfortunate. And, it says, you know, hospital workers are required to be hep have hepatitis B vaccine. So uh, they're required to, to disclose their TB status, uh, all sorts of things. And, and this one is, as Jeff points out, it's politicized. And, and I just can't believe the excuses that I hear from, from patients who don't want to be vaccinated. It's, they're very creative. <laughs> These are HIV patients. No, everybody. Oh. No, no, not HIV. I have not heard any blowback from, I have not had any blowback from people with HIV who are, for the most part, extraordinarily reasonable people. <laughs> On the other hand, uh, the people who refuse, uh, I just, just shake my head. People I meet socially uh, mm -hmm. and even patients in the office. I, I, I do have one patient with HIV who won't be vaccinated and, and you can, you can, uh, 
you can imagine who he voted for. <laughs> Go figure. With the hat and everything. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> you have more patience than I do dealing with someone like that. So. <laughs> Any other questions for Dr. Gottlieb? This has been amazing. We, oh. Go ahead and put your hand up either physically or use your uh, little tab. If not, we, we'd like to thank you. It's so amazing to hear uh, from you. Uh, I know uh, you were here a few years ago, and uh, it's, it's always incredible to hear your story and the history of that you've lived through. Thank you, Jeff, and thanks, everybody. I, oh, happy. thank you. That's, uh, it's been fun. Uh, I'll, I'll interrupt again. So, since I've, I've been recently uh, paying attention to some of the history of ACT UP, I was wondering if you have any reflection on how ACT UP influenced either your work uh, and of course the, the work of the scientists in the country? Well, I knew, uh, I knew Larry and I uh, knew Peter Staley and a number of other ACT UP principals. And I think ACT UP moved the agenda forward dramatically. It was necessary and uh, did great work. And uh, uh, if things hadn't, gotten better in the mid 90s i was i was as frustrated as everybody else and i was about to join act up <laughs> Good. so you know here on the west coast we had martin delaney did you ever have the opportunity to work with him i knew marty very well and uh his, he had a very important uh contribution with project inform uh project inform had a great newsletter they held summits and conferences and, and uh, uh, brainstorming sessions. They were great. Sweet. I remember I was living in San Diego at the time and they used to stop there on their way back from drug runs to Tijuana. And they were picking up this kind of this underground uh, virus club type thing they were doing. And they would stop right. in San Diego and give uh, one of their talks there. So I, I you know, for, for people who were younger who didn't understand what was happening in those years, uh, I tend to advise them to watch certain movies. I think the movies for me really make a difference. And so I advise them to watch Philadelphia, starting with Philadelphia, and then to watch uh, How to Survive a Play, the doc documentary, you know, Dallas Buyers Club, I think really portrayed something of what it was like <laughs> in those days. And then The Normal Heart, and then Angels in America, and those are my those are my key five movies. There are probably others, but if you really want to get a flavor for what 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 this was all about and just how big this was, I mean, and and how it dominated life for so many years, uh, watch those movies. I'll just add uh, the other documentary about ACT UP, in, in addition to How to Survive a Plague, is United in Anger. Mm -hmm. which is um, the other, another documentary. And, and Sarah Schulman has just published her uh, uh, book. Oh, I can't remember the title now, but it, it's, a, it's encompassing the oral history of ACT UP. Huh. And that was just published uh, about a week or so ago and, and got very positive review in the New York Times. And so just to mention that as, as more research, if anyone wants to do. Yeah, thanks for that. Yeah, uh, Michael Luella did post the link, the YouTube link to United in Anchor in the, uh, the mm -hmm. chat if people are interested. Joseph, you had a question. I don't really have a question. I just want to thank Dr. Gottlieb. Dr. Gottlieb, it's always mm -hmm. such a pleasure and such an honor to have you speak. The community just values so much when you open up and share your knowledge and share everything that you share is so means so much to us, whether where people living with HIV are working in this field, it, you never say no to us and you always show up and you always deliver and you always just open up and it means a lot to us. So thank you for being here with us. And especially this week, it's just really an honor to, to have you begin this week with us. Well, I'm glad to, to be here. I'm glad that we all are here. Thanks. Thanks, Joseph.
Well, and speaking of people we want to thank for always being here, Joseph is the reason we have Dr. Gottlieb today. Joseph is with uh, Janssen Pharmaceuticals and very, they very generously uh, paid his honorarium. So we want to thank him for making this. And gave me the idea back in February, I think. It's like, what are you doing for <laughs> you know, June 5th? And it's like, gosh, I haven't thought that far <laughs> in advance. He said, he should get Gottlieb before everybody else does. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we have Joseph to thank. Uh, we appreciate that. Um, just looking at the chat, uh, we have several people saying, don't ever retire, you're a national treasure. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not what you want to hear. <laughs> no, I, I, I love what I do. So uh, retirement is not, that's not right on the horizon. That's for sure. Good. And then another question from Bob Holtz is, what are you working on now? Well, uh, I've basically gone back to my roots as a doctor. Uh, I am not working on a book. Uh, I'm uh, not doing research. Uh, I think younger people are doing that. And uh, basically going back to my roots as being a HIV doc and a general medicine doc, which I'm enjoying a lot. And so I'm getting to manage all the, I'm learning about you know, other things, I'm learning about diabetes management and blood pressure management. And uh, so that's, uh, that's why I got into this business in the first place. It wasn't you know, to be involved in politics or uh, you know, philanthropy or anything else. I, I just you know, like medicine. So that, that's it. Thank you. Are you planning to, to get a new specialty in geriatric medicine? Is you, <laughs> I might have to be grandfathered in. I'm not going to take <laughs> it. I'm not taking any tests. <laughs> Hey, any other questions for uh, Dr. Gottlieb before we? Uh... Just again, thank you so, so much. Thank you very much. Thank and thank you all for listening and being here and, and uh, still keeping the, the flame alive and you know, keeping, keeping uh, an interest and, and keeping the public advised of what's going on because you know, it ain't over. You know, we're surviving with HIV and and uh, that's a good thing. The public public needs to know about uh, about uh, and, they, and they shouldn't forget. And, and and they shouldn't forget the people we lost to HIV. And uh, you all probably might know that the Saturday is going to be the dedication of the, the AIDS monument here in Los Angeles, mm. West Hollywood. And so uh, you know we should should. Remember, it's just, just cool to remember where we were and, and this is how far we've come. Exactly, thank you. And, and what we lost. Yeah. yeah. I know it's, you know, there's been a, a real spate of, of, of films and books and stuff coming out in the last couple of years around the pandemic. And I think a lot of people are kind of looking at their legacy and making sure that this doesn't happen again. And I think the last year has really shown us how important a message that is. So it's, it's great to see see all this and have this opportunity with you. Thank you, Jeff. And thanks, Joseph. And thanks, everybody, for being here. I'm going to sign off and grab a bite. <laughs> Thank you again. Uh -huh. Have a wonderful Thank evening. Thanks, Dr. Gottlieb. And before Thanks. we join, I, I just want to let people know that we are um, going to go back to our pre-pandemic schedule. Um, looks like June 15th, everything's supposed to return back to normal, whatever that is. So we are gonna take our usual summer hiatus for positive life in July and August, assuming that people are gonna be doing a lot of traveling that they couldn't do the last year and resume again in September. Um, so that would be September 8th, I think. Um, and that'll be a program on benefits um, and especially um, the Medicare um, open enrollment period and the Medicare and Medigap plans, Medicare Advantage plans that are available with uh, Cesar Perez and Brian Billharts. Um, Bill Hart's insurance. So um, in the meantime, if you have any questions or um, suggestions for topics or speakers, uh, always you can always email me. And oh, Andrew's saying September 7th. Thank you. It's the day after Labor Day. So uh, have a wonderful summer, everyone, and we'll see you uh, again in the fall. Mm. Hopefully. Thank you, Jeff. Yet. Jeff, thank you. <laughs> and of course, Joseph, thank you for uh, 
uh, bringing the sponsorship to this uh, program, which you didn't even mention. Somebody else had to. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Joseph. Thank you all. Thanks, everyone. Have a great night. Bye. Bye. Bye.